Hi everyone, <laughs> thanks for coming so early. Like it's been incredibly early for me. I'm like, I don't know, I'll try to wake you up if I can, but we'll see how it goes. So I'm Dimitri and I'm here to talk to you about benchmarking. Uh, now I'm actually curious about uh, how many of you actually have something to do with databases. Yep. And how many of you are actually curious about database performance and like, you know, benchmarking stuff, profiling and so on? Okay, I see, I've got my audience, that's really cool. Uh, yeah, one note. So the point is that I know everybody pretty much got like strong opinion about benchmarking and performance. That's why in this talk we'll try to like reduce the scope a little bit. And what we're going to talk about is following. So usually what happens and what usually I was doing personally is that when you would like to evaluate the performance of your database, like when maybe in conjunction with an application or just like, you know, separately within some particular environment, you just pick up some particular workload generation tool, you know, like something that runs PCC or I don't know, D, H, E, whatever existed out there. Or maybe if you need to maybe even run your real business application, you run, maybe you even replicate your real, real, um, real business workload, just like, you know, a copy from the production database, and then you start this tool, you run, you get some numbers, you're happy, you report those numbers, maybe in some, I don't know, in some reports, high uh, up the line, you know, to let other people know what's going on, and then you forget about this, and then, maybe after a week or so, you try to reproduce the benchmark. And you think, oh, oh crap, numbers are quite different, right? So um, in this situation, it's a very unpleasant situation to be in, unfortunately. And I have to admit, even me personally, every time when I'm trying to evaluate something, every time, every single time I get this situation, literally. It's very embarrassing, but like that's why I have learned this stuff. So uh, usually what happens is that, yeah, you figure out maybe there was some misconfiguration or maybe there was, I don't know, something that was forgotten, I don't know, cloud infrastructure was behaving strangely. Anyway, you figure this out, if you like fix your numbers, you repeat it again, you correct your numbers in the report and so on, but now we've got a problem. From now on, from this point on, you do not trust the numbers that you get from the off-the-shelf tooling. So, like, literally, all those numbers, you start to ask yourself, how much, like, how can I get more confidence in these results in those reports that I'm getting from, like, from those tooling, right? What kind of methods could I use to boost my confidence in this regard? And that is uh, going to be essentially the scope of our talk today. So we will try to investigate what kind of methods and tooling we get from, especially from statistics, to actually get more confidence about what we're doing when we're evaluating performance, especially for databases. So now, before we start, we have to actually establish the mental model. How are we going to think about this problem? I appreciate that everybody is, of course, thinking differently about this problem, and this is just one of the examples, but I find this particular example convenient to use. So I personally prefer to think about benchmarking and performance evaluation as a problem of evaluating a complex system. So the database in this case is going to be essentially just something that looks like a complex system for us. And we evaluate this system on the space, you know, in mathematics it's called usually a phase space or in statistics it's going to be a design space. So essentially like a sort of a graphic representation, graph representation of your system where every single point on this graph represents essentially your system, some state of your system. So on this graph you, for example, see on the slide you can see an example of like one of those uh, phase trajectories for Lorentz attractor taken from a sci some interesting scientific paper and you see that uh, it produces a very interesting form here which you, which you can project on one of the directions, on one of the dimensions and you get even something, you know, something that looks quite interesting like something that looks like, I don't know, maybe even some, um, I don't know, performance metrics you can get from your database. But if you pull them together, they produce a very nice picture in this 3D place and that's what I'm talking about. Now the problem is, that unfortunately it's not so easy. And when we're talking about databases, they're extremely complicated, right? So there's going to be a huge amount of various dimensions we're talking about. So obviously database parameters, right? Every single parameter you're going to change, you're going to change your, uh, essentially you're going to change your system, your behavior. Uh, obviously we are constrained to a certain degree with hardware resources as well, which means that like amount of available memory or CPU cores and so on, it's also going to be obviously part of our phase space. Now interestingly enough, the workload itself is also going to be a part of our phase space because it's pretty much like intuitively you can get it. So if you run for example one query per minute, you will get pretty much different result when you're going to run like a millions of queries per second or something like this. 
And now, finally, performance results are actually going to be one part of our model as well. It's something that we're actually going to get out of the system. So like, for example, query latencies, throughput, or something like this. Now, what usually happens is that obviously there's a lot of dimensions. So when we benchmark something, we essentially say that we would like to fix almost all of them. We, we're going to say that they're not interesting for us, for something that we're testing. And we evaluate only how the database is performing within some subset of those dimensions. Like we pick up literally a couple of those. Like in this case, we, pick, we evaluate how Postgres is uh, performing in regards of uh, query latency, shared buffers that we allow for the database to use, and queries thread that we apply. And here, so it's not a real data, it's something you can theoretically expect. So the idea here is that essentially if you give a Postgres some reasonable amount of share buffers, not too much, not too few, you're probably going to get best performance. And at the same time, obviously, when you're going to increase query rate, you're going to make everything slower, you're going to take more resources, so your query latency is probably going to high. Well, go, go high. So that's what it looks like, but now it's still not a full story, unfortunately. So the point is that uh, some of those dimensions I was talking about, they are regular dimensions. They're like deterministic, shared buffers. You just set the value and it, it is how it is. Now, unfortunately, some of those dimensions are non-deterministic. So like query latency, for example, is not going to be the same over and over no matter how frequently you run it. So it's going to be vary, obviously, which means that here, here's the point where we actually have to use statistics to define those things. We have to model these dimensions as uh, random variables, so with the corresponding you know, uh, distribution behind, with the corresponding statistics, and so on and so forth. So that's pretty much it for the model. And to summarize, uh, when we're doing benchmarking, essentially, we are dealing with two factors. When we uh, evaluate the performance of a database, we have some already known part we are aware about, like some uh, known details. For example, we know how shared buffers uh, influence the overall performance, and we try to evaluate those factors in the presence of some unknown factors. Like, for example, we have no idea, let's say, how work memory is affecting database, or there is some noise in the system that we have no idea about. Or, for example, cloud infrastructure is doing something strange, right? So this duality is very important for benchmarking. And in fact, throughout the whole presentation, throughout the whole slides, I will try to emphasize this. And this duality comes quite close together with another duality when we're saying that when we benchmark something and we'd like to understand the results, we always have to combine two skills. We have to combine the common skills, general skills, like a statistics or something, or experimental designing skills, when we would like to address this unknown part. And at the same time, we would like to use some particular domain model knowledge, like for example, Postgres internals knowledge, to get uh, to extend your known part and to reduce your unknown part. So you cannot go without another one, you know? So now, to emphasize this part, we're going to essentially, the rest uh, part of the stock, the rest uh, slides are going to be divided into two categories. The first, we're going to talk about some Postgres specifics, and the second about like the common parts, about the unknown things. So uh, let's talk about how to actually not screw up when you benchmark Postgres. Uh, now, how many parameters do you know to, uh, that you usually have to configure for Postgres database when you like create it and run it? Any any ideas? Any clues? Just chat from the from the list. I think the latest version was containing about between 300 and 400 parameters or something like this. So like the, this uh, global unified um, uh, configurables or options. Obviously, not all of them are very important. I don't know, it doesn't really matter how much you're going to configure, how you're going to configure, for example, authentication. But I've put on the slide some, just from, on, from top of my hand, some re relatively important things you have to be looking at when you would like to evaluate the performance. Interestingly enough, there is a paper from the author tune folks. You probably heard about them. They're trying to apply machine learning algorithms to uh, tune the databases, well, like MySQL, Postgres, and so on. And in their recent paper, they have actually mentioned that the win performance when they can get from machine learning algorithms, the biggest chunk of it could be actually acquired by configuring only two knobs. And I have put them at the top of the list, so shared buffers and max wall size. So that's essentially the most important or like the biggest chunk of the performance win you can get just by configuring those two things. But obviously the rest are still important, work mem, checkpoint, or all the flush after parameters, they are sort of important to fine tune your database. And what usually happens obviously, if you misconfigure this stuff, you get like maybe some parameters too low or too high. Unfortunately, the, you know, there's always this sweet spot you have to achieve and it's hard to find it out unfortunately. 
Now, the tricky part is that Postgres relies quite a lot on the operating system, on Linux or whatever you run it. And the problem is that if you would like to really get the best performance, you cannot get away without configuring the operating system as well. So if we're talking about Linux, for example, most of the time when like everything that has to do with a uh, file system cache, for example, or IO, uh, it's obviously something that you have to look at. So like, for example, yeah, you cannot get away. Yeah, you cannot forget like huge pages anymore on the big servers. You have to configure probably a dirty amount of like how the file system cache flashing is working and so on. And obviously like IO scheduler and so on. It's always interesting to uh, experiment with. Now, another important part quite frequently it happens that people are essentially ignoring the noise in the system. So they're saying, yeah, it's my real system, like the noise is a part of the system and so on and so forth. I strongly disagree with this point and I always suggest when you benchmark something, try to reduce the noise as much as possible, obviously because in the, even in the real system you would, not like, you, you would not like to get your performance for right quite a lot. So where are the noise is coming from? Uh, unfortunately, the answer to this question lies quite significantly it depends on the workload you're using. So, for example, if you're doing some CPU bound, uh, CPU bounded load, most likely you have to thinking about, for example, pinning of the CPU or NUMA cores, so like you know to uh, to, to to minimize the uh, contact switches and so on. You have to think if you're like really doing this on a bare metal, you have to think about P state or similar alternative for AMD or frequency scaling, so like you know power consumption versus uh, power consumption policies. Now, if you go one level higher and you're thinking and you're creating an I.O. bound benchmark, now you probably have to think about different matters. So the different scale of things start to play a role. And uh, for example, you have to think about the file system you're using. So for example, most likely you would like to run your benchmark with already pre-created wall segments because uh, creation of the files, including walls, uh, wall segments, is actually uh, an annoyingly slow operation just because of this like journaling and the file system and so on and so forth. And obviously, like, yeah, you have to configure your NV device, it should not be trimming while you're doing something and so on. And the last part, probably the, more, the most nasty one, is about cloud infrastructure. Whether we like it or not, unfortunately, most of the benchmarking that we're doing nowadays is happening on the cloud infrastructure, which means that we have to always think about keep in mind noisy, na noisy neighbors and as much as possible try to isolate our environment. And at the same time, we also need to understand virtualized infrastructure quirks. So for example, when for example, hypervisor stops you or something like this, unfortunately, it's not always possible to configure these things, but at least you need to be aware about them. Now, one interesting thing is that people also always forgetting about, especially those folks who used to do performance evaluation for stateless applications before, is that how long should you run benchmark actually? So the question is very, uh, well, it depends quite a lot because it, matter, it's, it depends on what kind of effects you would like to capture in your benchmark. Uh, for example, such important things as auto vacuum that I put on the slide, uh, if you would like to capture it for the real database, you have to configure it and you have to wait long enough. So sometimes it depends. Sometimes, for example, there are advices to run your benchmark for one day or something. So of course, it depends. It should not be always such an extreme, but at least you need to understand what kind of factors in your Postgres database you're capturing, whether it's a checkpoint or auto vacuum and such. Now we're starting to go to fun stuff. So uh, one sometimes forgotten thing is the workload generator plays quite important role as well. So the point is that uh, people not always think about this, but workload generator could be a bottleneck on its own, unfortunately. And for example, PGBench has its own history, unfortunately, of being you know, a little bit slower than necessary. Uh, for example, the very first example I was showing before with two different results, that was actually obtained sim simply by running PGBench, but the second version was uh, recording latencies for every query. So even this was already, this operation, relatively fast operation, was enough to actually slow down like a real throughput numbers from the database. But that's only a part of the story, there is something more. So the point is that usually when we think about uh, benchmarking, or like when we're thinking about the real workload, what happens is that uh, queries that we receive for the database are relatively independent from the a query like from the database responses. So they just arrive in at some certain rate and they're like departing at some certain rate. Now in a Q in theory there is a such thing as open and closed system, maybe you have heard about this already. And they're quite different in behavior, how they behave. And the real system is usually open system or open-ish system. Now, the thing is that usually when we run some workload generator like PGBench or something similar, we usually simulate in a closed system, unfortunately. Because what happens is that the, um, the generator fires a query, it waits for the response, and then fires another one. So what happens is that we have a fixed amount of queries on the fly. 
and uh, this is essentially by definition a closed system and the, pr the problem is the difference is that for example you will get quite different latencies based on uh, such, such, a, such difference when you road test open or closed systems. Mm, the tricky part here is unfortunately almost all of the workload generators that I know they always simulate closed system and do not do not even allow you to configure this except a bench base. I have seen that they allows you to do uh, that they allow you to do a Poisson distribution for queries, so it's essentially going to be an open system. Now we're done with the first part with the particulars, and now let's go to some unknown details: how to actually use statistics to fight some factors you have no idea about. Uh, now the first thing I wanted to mention is that uh, actually the problem is not new uh, and industry have faced this problem already in many different ways uh, in the last century. So you see for example here I reference an article from a student from more than a hundred years ago when essentially what he wrote is that yeah like all the benchmark, all not the benchmarking of course, experimentation is matters as much as you only get some value out of it if you understand the statistical distributions behind it. And essentially this is a paper when uh, that for example student, famous student t-test was introduced. So you see the problem is being tackled already for quite a long time. Now the problem is well, okay, it's not a problem, I'm going to continue here. So uh, what does it mean? So this is essentially the whole statistics I'm going to show you, well, most of the statistics I'm going to show in the slides. And this is what you usually see when you like uh, read some uh, performance reports or something. So usually people just operate with those uh, uh, terms without thinking about them too much. But what happens is that essentially we're saying, yeah, okay, our values are random uh, variables with certain populations behind them. And those populations have some parameters like, I don't know, uh, mean values, or deviation, so on. And then we benchmark, we sample those populations, we acquire some amount of observations. This observation in turn has some statistics like averages, standard deviations, and so on. And based on these numbers, we essentially could get some confidence, uh, well, assurance for our data. So we could, for example, if we compare two different data sets, we could use a t-test to verify how different are they or not. Or we, for example, as the second one, we could build a confidence interval for our data. How confident are we that the real value of this population lies within what we have observed? Now you don't have to remember obviously those formulas. Uh, they pretty much exist in any single uh, data processing software you use. So yeah, you don't have to worry about this. But that's actually probably probably a part of the problem because you can easily misuse them. Unfortunately, you, uh, if you do not really know, or you, if you apply, for example, them in the context when it's not really um, suitable, let's say this way. So I'm going to explain. Uh, unfortunately, all those methods were actually developed for the situations where people were doing some experimentation in natural science, so like, you know, chemistry, biology, physics, whatever. And usually things are uh, distributed normally there, unfortunately. So there is a significant assumption behind all those tooling I was shown before. So there are two assumptions. One is normality distribution, and another one is what is called uh, independent, identically distributed variables. So Essentially, it says that there are a lot of small details that contributes to the noise, but they essentially contribute both in an equal way. And on this graph, I sh I'm showing you a probability distribution, this bell curve, the blue one. That's essentially how the normal distribution looks like. Now, in computer science, we have a big problem. In computer science, almost everything that we're going to test is not normally distributed, unfortunately. So you see this red line? That's essentially how it looks like normally. And the problem is that it's heavily skewed. So there are quite a huge tails usually, and you see there is a significant skew to the right. And intuitively, you can even understand why is it happening. So the thing is that in the queue, in the computer system, everything is a queue, essentially. And yeah, you know, there is a baseline you can get, the best case. And then whenever the queue is getting congested or something, that you are getting slowed down. And essentially, it means that we can get only slower usually. That's why we have this skew, significant skew. Uh, and things could just not be suddenly magically faster. Now, this problem means that for us that unfortunately we could not use or we are not theoretically allowed to use all those methods or all those tooling I was shown before, which is quite unfortunate. Uh, now, probably a little bit a controversial topic, but although you may hurt uh, in like, you know, there are a lot of advices or like uh, things that people are saying, yeah, do not use those things for non-normal uh, distributions and so on. There is a trick. 
I have put a couple of references on the slide so that like I'm not going to pull this controversial topic out of myself. There is like there is some research behind this, but the point is that you can actually try to say I'm not going to use a normality distribution, but I'm like normality assumption, but I'm going to approximate my data with normal a normal normal distribution. Now you shift your questions toward the question how good is approximation and so on, but nevertheless you can at least try to use those methods anymore anyway, and you still can get some number of some, some reasonable results. So for example, in the first reference you can get there is a authors are showing some interesting um, uh, data about how various statistics uh, are actually how much they're robust or not robust or normal non normality, and to show you that it's not like a theoretical thing. Last two references are something that you can find in the field. So the second one is about, for example, a project called Hunter, when folks are essentially trying to do a performance analysis for the ACI and they are uh, searching for change points. And they have explicitly modified the, the algorithm to actually use a t t, uh, t test, student t test, because it was more robust in their guest and they were just like fine with it. So it was working for them. And the same is, for example, for ClickHouse. So they have in their benchmarking tools, they also have a possibility to get some t, t, uh, t test uh, evaluation when needed, so it's also one. It's also something that sometimes it works. So it's not like it's completely you should not do this ever, 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 and so on. It's just something you have to keep in mind, and sometimes you can try it out, but you have to be aware that it's not always have to be working. Now, again, to show you that it's a very practical matter, you can extremely easily end up with a situation when your probability distribution is not normal. So here is on the slide I can show. I am showing you the probability distribution for latencies for one benchmark I was doing literally on my laptop. And the thing is that the amount of memory for Postgres was quite limited there. So for, for file system cache and for Postgres itself. And you see that uh, we, uh, we see here two spikes for latencies. It means that one was essentially uh, when we were satisfying our queries from the file system cache or for database uh, from, from shared buffers. And another one is when memory was not enough, memory was not sufficient, and then Postgres had to go and re literally read something from the disk. So that's why we see quite a significant difference between those uh, two spikes. And you see, it's completely not normal. It's even worse than that. It's a B model. So if you would like to get some like averages or medians, you will not get reasonable results whatsoever. And the usual advice, like, yeah, repeat your results, repeat your runs, and then try to find a converging consequence, it's not going to work here at all. Now, to prove that it's actually coming from the I.O., it's actually important to verify our benchmark, so I'm showing this in one slide. There is a difference about like 150 microseconds between those two, those two spikes, and you can, for example, verify it with BPF trace. There is this tool for IO latencies, and sure enough, when we take those distributions, we see that the most of the distributions are actually lying within this window we're looking for. So that's indeed an IO effect. And this is a situation when we have a slow path versus a fast path. That's actually quite frequent in the computer science, so it's very easy to end up with a situation. Now, I've told you that you are not allowed to use normal tools. So what should you do when you have this situation, this type of situations? Well, fortunately, to a certain degree, things are still straightforward, and you just have to replace, uh, not, not necessarily one-to-one, -one, but you have, to, you have to use different tools. So things already, of course, they have been investigated for quite a while, and it's in the first, not the first time when people are uh, you know, facing with this type of problems. And again, fortunately for us, although they are more complicated than usual, there are things that exist out there, and again, pretty much every single data processing uh, framework, SciPy, R, whatever, that you could use to actually uh, do the very same things as I was showing before, but for non-normal distributions. So, for example, you can replace an averages with just a median because it's a little bit more robust to non-normality. It's still not going to work for a B model, but it's a little bit better. Uh, you have to probably stop thinking about like ever uh, standard deviations, and you probably have to think about quantiles and if you have seen, for example, in industry, we're always talking about percentiles and quantiles, and actually that's a part of the story. We're always interested in the outliers, or not necessarily outliers, but like what is a 99 percentile of the whole value, because we're curious about the diff like, you know, variance of our data. Uh, if you would like, for example, to figure out the outliers, you have to start thinking about using interquantile range, because that's essentially the best tool you can get for non-normal distributions. And the things like, for example, student t test, you could replace with, uh, replace with something like Man, Man Whitney test, which is a little bit more complicated, so that's why I'm posting here a SciPy functions for it. But the idea is the same. You get two, you get two uh, data series, and then you compare them, but then you're assuming that like, you're doing this non-parametric test, so it's going to be fine if the data is non-normally distributed. <laughs> 
Now, a couple of more details. Uh, one interesting question that pops up every now and then, again, about statistics is how much data do I need to collect, actually? How, more, how, how, um, how many runs do I need to do for my data? And unfortunately, it's hard to answer in general case, but here I'm quoting for you some interesting article about this topic when folks were investigating how much noise do they get from the cloud infrastructure. Uh, it was not AWS, it was something different, but nevertheless, that's like a pure hardware noise. And this variable E, uh, with this uh, a lot of numbers there, essentially that says how much uh, runs do you need to get, to, to need to perform to get within a 95 confidence interval, so that the value lies within 1% of the average value. So it's like essentially in the normal English it says that yeah, your your confidence is good enough. And uh, for the coefficient variance of uh, 0.3, so like the variance of the data was very slow, it was a CPU bound at benchmark, they were saying, yeah, okay, 10 runs is enough for us. So 10, 10 runs is nothing. Like, you know, you can get like a millions of this, and it means that essentially for a stable enough data, you're fine if you'll just get a little bit, you know, efforts and run something 10 times. Now when they were running something with a coefficient variance of 9%, they already had to run 240 benchmarks. And I think this was the case when they were even getting something against, they were testing some IO uh, workloads with Theo against like the, 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 the devices they were using there and there they were even have to run, they even had to run 640 or something. So uh, I'm all along these lines, so those are ballpark numbers you can expect. Uh, when answering these questions, so obviously, as I mentioned before, it's very much depends on like, your particular situation, but at least this is your expectations, what you can see from your benchmarks. <clears throat> and now another very interesting question is about like, and this is actually partially an inspiration for this whole talk because um, Mark Callaghan was asking this question once, like from the like statistical perspective, what does it make sense to run? Uh, several shorter benchmarks or one longer benchmark? So is there any difference? So obviously, at least I'm still con uh, convinced that uh, most of the time, especially when you're talking about da databases, those are two different cases, you cannot really compare them, but from the Q in theory, there's a very interesting thing that you can uh, take a look at, uh, where essentially we're saying that when you run a longer benchmark and we run several shorter benchmarks, they're going to be equivalent if we assume that our system is ergodic. Uh, in this case, ergodic essentially means that uh, history is repeating itself at some point. So when, for example, we have a queue, and then the results of this queue at some point are essentially start to repeat itself. And intuitively you can get that, yeah, it makes sense because, yeah, you can essentially at some point just start to discard your history, and then obviously it doesn't really matter if you run shorter benchmark or longer, be longer benchmark. Uh, but yeah, so it's a very interesting result. You may essentially replace one with another one, but at the same time, yeah, again, it depends very much on your situation. And the last but not least things, I've mentioned a lot of uh, details about how to reduce noise and how to fight with this using against various uh, statistical approaches and so on, but still, sometimes there's just noise you have to live with, unfortunately, or for example, autocorrelations you cannot, uh, um, you know, you cannot get, to, uh, get rid of and something that you're just not in your control. And in this case, it does not happen that quite frequently, but some people are doing this, but you could try to use randomized testing. The idea is essentially that you have, for example, two setups, two database setups you would like to test with, and then you do not test them like one and then another one, but you send queries to one and another one uh, randomly at the same time. So for example, ClickHouse folks, they even uh, go to the little bit more they go to a little bit more uh, higher degree, for example, they even run both databases on the same virtual machine when they're doing this testing. But essentially, randomized part is, yeah, you just have to switch queries every now and then. And the point is that uh, via this, you're introducing some normal distribution that is going to essentially spread this noise normally across two uh, different tests that you're performing. And overall, the noise is going to contribute the same amount of uh, influence on the benchmark. And now, final thoughts, a couple of takeaways for you folks to remember. Uh, probably the most important one is, I would like to remember, is that benchmarking is not so dry and, you know, about numbers and statistics. Benchmarking exploring is extreme fun, actually. And every time when you evaluate something, you learn something, literally, that's really cool. And this idea about known versus unknown and common versus particular is actually very important because you cannot get away doing evaluation only knowing all the statistics but without knowing the details of the Postgres, for example. And at the same time, other way around. If you know all the things about the Postgres internals but have no clue about statistics, it's still no use for you, unfortunately. And the last thing I have not mentioned explicitly, but you could see this throughout the slides, is that statistics is very important as a language. So if you use those primitives and those tools, you can always ideally, you can always uh, 
uh, convey the idea of what have you found actually in a more concise manner and so that everybody can understand you. So that's pretty much it. I hope you have some amount of questions. I guess we have a couple of minutes, so yeah. Yeah, any questions? Yeah, please. More of a comment than a question. I definitely second your observation that normal distribution is like no go for benchmarks and, uh, and computers, that it just doesn't go well. And in my experience, there is a lot of very interesting stuff going on beyond the 99 percentile. So what is usually considered the noise, especially in network bound benchmarks, is very often the interesting part, which is like, you have to look to the long tail because that's where the interesting things are happening. And I'll have to mention something else about that. <laughs> I can actually recommend in this regard, I have a reference somewhere here, I think, wait a moment, where was it? Yeah, this one. Uh, this is a, a talk down there. Well, it's a paper and talk as well from RP uh, HPC folks, and they're doing even more fancy stuff exactly for networking there because networking for RPG, uh, HPC is always important to distribute workload and so on. So t uh, check this out. That's definitely interesting. Okay, I get it just too early in the morning, so probably you're just asleep. So yeah, uh, thanks nevertheless, uh, and yeah, have a nice day. <laughs>